I'm Tom Ray, and this is my art podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I get the chance to meet... My name is Betty. I run Revitalized, which is me basically cutting records and designing things with those records. So how did the whole thing get started? How did Revinylized begin? So it started in 2012. So we were on a trip in Vegas Mm -hmm. and we were at a gift shop, I believe in like Hard Rock. As we were strolling around, I saw like this Motley Crue bracelet that was made out of vinyl. And it's very different from like the bracelets I made. Mm -hmm. It was like cuts. It was like... Just put together, it was sewed, um, riveted. It was just very different from the way I do it. But it just gave me the idea that you could manipulate vinyl. Mm -hmm. So when I went home, because I've I've always had tons and tons of records. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I have always had a great extensive record collection, but I also have a lot of garbage. Leftover garbage. Garbage in what sense? You're not saying like Frito-Lay bags and stuff. What, what no, kind of garbage? Garbage vinyl. Mormon tabernacle. Like You have a lot of vinyl that it's like, I'm never going to listen to this. No, when you accumulate, you know, collections, mm-hmm. like when you buy collections, you're going to take a lot of good with the bad. Mm-hmm. So like so, auctions and stuff. Yes, exactly. Or estate sales. Anywhere that when I'm trying to accumulate, you know, the the vinyl that I want just when I was trying to get records that I always wanted just for my my collection Mm -hmm. not when I wanted to cut up vinyl I would have to take a lot of crap with it and I never wanted to just throw it away so I just took it and accumulated it Mm -hmm. never knowing what I was ever going to do with it so like I said when I came along and saw that idea that you could actually wow, manipulate it, like actually cut it up and do something with it. The light bulb went off in my head that, wow, you can actually cut it, manipulate it, do something with it. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, when we went home, that's how it was kind of born. Like, okay, we can do something with this. I also have been bidding on auctions and estate sales and things like that. And I I go more the toy route, Mm -hmm. but what will happen is I'll get a bunch of like Viewmaster discs. What am I going to do with those? So you were already collecting these things is what you're saying. Yeah, years and years, years and years ago. But you don't want to just throw it in the landfill, right? Right. And Goodwill doesn't want it. Record stores don't want it. So what do you do with it? So now I finally started thinking of what to do with it. And that coupled with being unemployed, my job at the time, well, I got laid off, basically. Mm. I wanted to go back to school, but... I also had a five-year-old daughter at the time, too, so then I did go back to school, but then we also started this as well. What did you go back to school for? I went for my bachelor's degree in social work. Oh, wow. I do that now, but because at the time when I did go back to school, I was also getting unemployment, so I was still getting a check, Mm -hmm. as well as going back to school, but I could still do this, Mm -hmm. as well as kind of getting paid, too. So to create those things, you don't just go, oh, I can take my record collection and make stuff out of it. You got to know how, like what was one of the first things you made and how did you learn how to make it? If I tried to bend into a bracelet, I would just basically break a record. We boil it. it. Just started using like methods of heat. Like first of all, we did start with bowls, right? Mm -hmm. Boiling vinyl in like hot water. So we just experimented with different uh, temperatures of water. You were like looking this stuff on YouTube or what? Um, I don't know if we were, maybe at the time we were, I mean, I, gosh, it was like nine years ago, eight years ago. Yeah. I do remember it was just hot water on the stovetop. Yeah, just okay. cutting slabs. And it just, yeah, that how we started with the bracelets. What does that smell like when you boil vinyl? There's different types of vinyl, as you know. Yeah. Pretty, like the 78s, we don't mess with 78s. Really? Why? Because they're harder and a lot of yeah. times they break. Yeah. So I don't mess with those. And I like the the vinyl from like the 80s, they're real soft, real bendy, you know. I like okay. using that stuff. And it doesn't hurt your wrist to cut so much. But that stuff doesn't bother me so much. Okay. But the older stuff that is right. really smells toxic. Before all this, did you have any like creative or crafting or artistic no. background? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. I don't consider myself an artist at all. But a creator. I mean, you're creating things. I still, you know, some of the vendors that that, that I go to shows and, and do shows with, they have some, you know, amazing yeah. 
talent. Right. Nothing that, like I do it when I sit at my living room coffee table, and some of the people that that I do shows with are really amazing yeah. talent. So you went from making the bulls, and then you've made a lot more stuff since then. So you moved on to the bulls, you did the bracelets. Yeah. And then you're like, what else could I do? So what are some of the things you make? We make the clocks, and like we do like the stencils and then onto the clocks also we do um like desk clocks too where we take like we just kind of cut the the record down a little bit and then bend uh, melt so it so it stands on its own other than that i do like earrings i do some jewelry other than the bracelets i i will tell you this i sell a lot of bracelets online and i absolutely hate making them Really? I will say that. I just hate making them. But just because you've done them so long or they take long? Tedious. Okay. They're tedious. I will say that. But I will make them. I keep making them. Yeah, I, I, of I course. Made, I just made one right before I came here. <laughs> just saying. A lot of guitar pick earrings. Yes. Online, online, I make a lot of them. I enjoy the the coasters you've been doing recently, too. I think that's when I first started following you on Instagram. Yeah, and those have nothing to do with vinyl. Those are just ceramic ties. Well, and that's what I was getting at is, like, you, you must have realized at some point it's like, you did the vinyl. Well, now you've got a bunch of LP sleeves that are left over. So it looks like you kind of started using that or well, I've seen notebooks not- that you've done. Oh, the notebooks. Yeah. So there's a record store in Eau Claire because I'm from, I'm from that area. There's a shop up there that I went in there one day and I just started talking to the owner. This is a few years ago. And he told me that he donates like 20,000 records a year because he just has no room. So I made a deal with him about some of the jackets and the records that we could come to some sort of deal. And so we did. And so a lot of the jackets I get from him, like Beatles, I mean, really good jackets. So I make notebooks from those. I take the 45s. Also, I use 45s as well for little little journal notebooks Mm -hmm. and then I also take 33s and make larger notebooks basically with the 33s take like a paper puncher and stuff and then I spiral the needle nose pliers and stuff Really? Mm -hmm. and then with the 45s I like drill holes and stuff and then yeah everything is like one day I'm gonna have arthritis How did you get here from Eau Claire? Like, how did you end up in Madison? I've been here since I was 18. So there was a band that I met when I was 15 that played up in Eau Claire called Rap Scallion. My friend and I just became very good friends with them. And my mom used to let me come down here all the time in high school. I just, I just liked Madison so much. And I was a lost kid. And then when I was like in high school, the friend I went to that show with, she actually passed away when we were 16. And so then I was like, what am I going to do? Because I want to go to college, but I don't want to go. I, just one of those kids, I didn't know what I want to do with myself. But I always had this connection to Madison. So I've been just here ever since. You've been going to a lot of craft fairs and things like that as well, selling yes. this stuff. So how did you get involved in uh, that sort of thing? There used to be this girl, I forget her name. She's just no longer around, though. She used to do this craft fair at the Eastside Businessmen's Club. And she had one, like the vintage craft market or something like that. And I just heard about her and I just thought, Let's just try it. And I made a couple hundred bucks. And I felt like maybe we could, maybe this is a path for me. How many of them do you do a year now? Probably 50 to 60. How many of them are in Madison or do you travel all over the place? Where do you go? Uh, Mostly a lot of them are in Madison. I'm starting to branch out more now. Like I like being in Madison, but I like traveling now more. Now I'm starting to do more sci-fi ones. I like being in that kind of crowd, so I don't bring any of the music stuff. Like, what are the things you're making for that specific market? I like Game of Thrones stuff, a lot of pop culture stuff. Just eliminate all the music stuff. So all my tiles, all my ceramic tiles and stuff, I'll bring, but I wouldn't bring the ones that are band-related. Sci-fi movies, sci-fi TV, that kind of stuff. What made you to, uh, figure out to go into that, or were you already kind of leaning towards yes, that? I, I saw that what, when I was making making stuff like that, I would I would see that people would go nuts over that stuff and buy it a lot and go, wow, that's really cool. And they would buy a lot of that. So then I thought, well, let's just try, like, it's called a geek craft. 
And I did one two years ago when it was here in Madison at the Masonic Center. Yeah, I actually went to that. Okay. And I made a lot of money. And I was like well received. And I thought, I need to do way more of these. And then also I got contacted by Wizard World, but the vendor fee is super expensive. Like, I can't afford that. And I had to have a lot of stuff, and I'm not a sweatshop. It's just me. This is when I was on Etsy. I'm not on Etsy anymore. I got kicked off of Etsy, actually. Why? Copyright stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I can't, I can't be on Etsy anymore. So that just showed there is an interest. So I just saw that there is a big interest for it. And then so that brought me to the Twin Cities. I actually found one Comic-Con that wasn't too expensive mm -hmm. and it was way in advance so I'm like oh, I'm gonna apply and see if I got it yeah. and I think it went to my spam or something because I went and I was like oh let's go to that I never heard back from them but I'd still like to check it out went there I apparently had a booth oh, and I had no idea <laughs> So I went there and there was, I was like, I didn't know I was supposed to be in this. Weird story because it was the only Comic-Con I ever got in. Really? Yeah. And, and the vendor fee is a little bit steep. It's like, yes. it's like 300 yeah. And then you have to figure in like your travel and your stay. But for me, what, what I look at it is, because I do have a kid, right? I look at it as, because I really love Minneapolis too. Yeah. And it's right downtown Minneapolis. Yeah. And I don't get the opportunity to always go to downtown Minneapolis, right? And I, I always make my money back and then, and then some. But I always look at it as a little trip. How do you prepare all your stuff to setting up the booth and like traveling and stuff? How did you figure out a way to display your things? Well, I've had like eight years of practice. Plus, I, I've got, you know, you only get a table. Mm -hmm. So you, you got to make do with just a table. Right. So it's not a whole lot of room, right? Yeah, the thing is, is... The best is to go up. The tiles go in the suitcase. And when I first started, I used to do outdoor events. And I used to get a 10 by 10 tent. I had a ton of room. So imagine condensing that down to just one table. But now that's simple and I almost prefer it. After a while, you're like, when it's all on that, on that one table, especially with the suitcase, you know, when you've got all them tiles, mm -hmm. it makes it look like there's a lot there. Yeah. But you don't want it to make it look like it's all smashed together, though. Learned over the years to put it together. Sometimes it looks junky, depending if I'm tired. How much stuff do you actually have pre-made? I don't know if you do it made to order or if you just make stuff and go, I need this many pieces. I'm terrible at it because a lot of my stuff uh, is at Monona store at Booth 121. So we're, be we're coming off the holidays, so a lot of my stuff went there because I do sell online too. I'm not very prepared. I also have another side business that I'm doing. I sell clothes, but I'm a very serious reseller of clothes. And so I'm really into that right now. With all the stuff you're making, is there anything you wish or want to learn going like, oh, I, I want to learn this next because I think it'll really help out what I'm doing. I do want to get into the laser cutting. What would that take? Have you looked into it? Well, obviously I would need the tools. And there's the Bodgery open, which I keep meaning to like get over there. It's in the old Oscar Mayer. Somewhere in Oscar Mayer, it's, it's there where anybody can go in there and you can apply for a membership where it's like a maker space for anybody. And every Monday and Friday, you can do like a open house to kind of walk through it. So anybody can go and you can rent tools and stuff. So if you want to get into woodworking, you want to get into maybe graphic artistry or something like that, you can go in there and rent tools, rent space, take classes, that sort of thing. I had not heard of that. Yeah, go check it out. So I keep meaning to do that. But the one thing that I wish I had more of is time because I'm up to like midnight every single night. Because I work, I go to my main job, and then I go home and I work. Mm -hmm. I don't live a, a rich lifestyle, but, I mean, I want to be able to, like, travel. That's not an outlandish goal. No, it's not. <laughs> How was your holiday market this year? It was really good, yeah. How many of them did you do? Uh, four. Back to back, like, the last uh, weekend in November to, I believe, the 15th, whatever, that last Saturday, mid-December. Because then we went to Vegas for five days or something. You mentioned earlier that you are selling stuff online, but if you got kicked off of Etsy, where are you selling your stuff at now? Poshmark, Mercari, eBay, all my uh, jewelry, 
the the vinyl jewelry and stuff. But that's where I sell all the vinyl bracelets and the jewelry like crazy, almost to where I almost can't keep up. That's a good thing. It is a good thing, but like I said, it almost to the point where I'm almost considering taking the bracelets off just because it's almost too much. Some people forget that it's handmade. It's true because the one thing about Etsy is that it boasts it is a handmade market. Yes, and Poshmark, they can read that it's handmade. They can maybe understand that it's handmade, but at the end of the day when they receive that in the mail and they find one little, I don't know, imperfection or a flaw or whatever, they may open a case against me. And then I see that or I get a bad review because something didn't turn out right or something or didn't fit them right or something. Do you promote yourself at all? Like how do people find you or is it just by you just put it out there and then people come across it? Like how do you promote it? On Poshmark, I don't promote myself at all. And I'm terrible, terrible about social media. I'm horrible about it. It's just one thing I... Just, I don't ever go on Instagram. I just, I'm just terrible about it. I don't ever promote my stuff on Facebook. I don't know why. I guess I get caught up at work doing my job. Do you think you could benefit a little bit more, though, if you did? Yes, definitely I could. I could. But you're not at the point where you could have somebody take care of that for you. Part of me is a little bit worried about the copyright stuff. Because I remember when I was doing Etsy years ago, and I got that email from Etsy when they were taking me down, taking my shop down because of the copyright stuff. Did somebody complain or they just like looked at it one day? It was somebody related to Pearl Jam. I find that surprising considering the way they are about things. I feel like they would be like, oh, that's neat. She's doing that. Well, first of all, they're my favorite band of all time. And I'm saying usually they're pretty open about stuff like that. Like they fought Ticketmaster for crying out loud, you right, know? But I don't think it's them per se. I think it's more their licensing. So I think what happened way back when is I made something of theirs, not knowing anything about how this all works. And one of their fans reported me because I remember getting like just hated on. He started like on me about it because some of the fans and some of these groups. So like Pearl Jam tickets just went on sale for their tour and stuff. And their the ticket prices aren't bad. But the resale is like totally astronomical right now, right? Like the ticket price is like a hundred bucks, but in the resale groups are like eight hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people just that are able to get the tickets in like the ten club, they just go to resell the tickets. They do the same with the merchandise. So what I think is when I made something of of their merchandise, so somebody reported me or whatever and. That's what I think the whole licensing copyright thing came and evolved with Etsy. That's the tough part about doing that type yes. of work. So I got warned and then I made something else again, and I, which I didn't think would get me in trouble, and it did. And then I got pulled. My shop just got pulled. I got a, a notice that it, there was just being taken down. If people did want to check out your stuff, where should they go, considering you said you're bad at social media? Booth 121 in Monona. Those gals that own that store are great, and, and they're just wonderful for, for promoting local vendors. You can see more of Betty's creations on Instagram at Revinalized Madtown. Music for this podcast is from the song Just In Case by my band Lorenzo's Music at lorenzosmusic.com. Now, this is the last episode of this season, but I will be doing more very soon, so go to my website, tomraiswebsite.com, and sign up for the email list and subscribe to the show on Spotify or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, feel free to send me a message if you'd like to be on the show sometime. You can message me on Instagram or Facebook or even send me an email. You can email me at tom at tomraiswebsite.com. I'll be back with another show soon, so until then, so long. Mm-hmm.